Hello and welcome back to Start Learning Sets. Before we start, as always, I want to thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady or PayPal. In this part 4 today, I want to explain the Cartesian product and we also start talking about maps. The Cartesian product, also called just product set, is a new set we can form when we have two sets. The symbol we use is the cross between the two sets as a multiplication sign. Then this denotes the set of all pairs with an order where the first element comes from A and the second element comes from B. So you see, this is something new. Now we want that the order matters. Okay, before we write down the general definition, let's first look at an example. For A, I want a set consisting of three symbols, so let's take a triangle, a square and a circle. And for B, let's take a set with two numbers, maybe four, and 7. Now an ordered pair we would always denote with parentheses, so round brackets. Then we have a comma in the middle and on the left hand side we would have an element from A and on the right hand side an element from B. So for example triangle 7 would be an ordered pair, so an element in A times B. Hence you see, if we exchange the two elements here, we wouldn't get an element in this Cartesian product. Okay, now to get all the ordered pairs we want, it's always good to visualize something like a coordinate system. There, the first set A gets the x-axis and the second set B gets the y-axis. Hence we get out a table with six positions and each position corresponds to one uniquely given pair. So after filling in the table, we have the six elements and know that A times B, the Cartesian product, is exactly the set with these elements. Okay, most of the time this is enough for understanding the Cartesian product, you just have to take it that we now have a new symbol that has an order in it. But because we are here in the foundations, you might ask the question, how do we get from sets without an order to such an object with an order? And the answer is, this is not a problem, we can define the new symbol by just using sets. This is a good thing because it means we only need the set theory to explain such an ordered pair. So for two elements x and y, we may take from two sets, we can write this ordered pair as a set with at most two elements. Namely the first element should encode x at the first position and the second element should encode y at the second position. Of course there are different possibilities to do that, but I show you the one that is most common. One element of the set is the set that contains only x as an element. And the other element is a set with two elements, namely x and y. And there you see the encoding here, the number of elements here tells us the position. Okay, maybe you think that's a little bit strange, but actually it does exactly what we want. More concretely, what do we want when two pairs x, y and x tilde, y tilde coincide. For this please recall the example and then you know we want that x and x tilde coincide and also y and y tilde. And indeed we get this out when we use this one here as the definition for the ordered pair. Now since we know that two sets are equal if and only if they have the same elements, we can write down this is logically equivalent to the set with x is the same as the set with x tilde and the set with x and y is the same as the set with x tilde and y tilde. And with this we have the equivalence that x is x tilde and y is y tilde. Of course this is the thing we wanted, we have an actual first position and an actual second position. And this is what you should remember and then we don't need the definition with the sets anymore. Now by knowing what an ordered pair really is, we can write down the definition of the Cartesian product. So A times B is the set that has all ordered pairs as elements. From this point on, every time you see this cross as a multiplication sign between two sets, you know it simply denotes this Cartesian product. With this knowledge we can do even more, because we can also consider subsets in the Cartesian product A times B. We can do the same as before and visualize the Cartesian product as a coordinate system as here and then a subset would be just a collection of elements here in this plane. 
Now, such a chosen subset encodes information about the relation between the two sets. So maybe the whole thing here reminds you of something you already know, because we have an x-axis, a y-axis and something in between. And indeed, now we want to define what a function is. So let's consider a subset, which I call gf, for reasons I explain later. And the subset is called a function if it fulfills something we call write unique. Of course, this is something we can describe by using quantifiers and the element set relation. Here you see we go through all the elements x on the left hand side and all the elements y and y tilde on the right hand side. And both pairs, but with the same x, should lie in the subset gf. Here you might already know what we want for a function is a uniquely determined y for a given x. So the subset should be more like a one-dimensional line in the plane. Also, it shouldn't look like this on the right hand side, because if you fix an x here, you see we have two corresponding y's. So you see, what we need in the definition is that this assumption brings us to y is equal to y tilde. Okay, maybe it looks complicated, but it's just the idea you see here on the left. We want something like this, where each x gets at most one y, and not two as here. Of course, we will now introduce a better notation, because such functions will be so important for all mathematics we will do later. However, for this we also need that each x on the x-axis here gets exactly one y. Or by using short formulas, this reads as for all x in A, there exists an y in B, such that the pair xy lies in our subset. Then we can truly write f colon a to b with a new arrow between the sets and also f of x is equal to y. So this is a new notation we use when x, y as a pair is in the subset. If we write everything in this way, we call the object we get a map. And the name we have chosen here is f. More concretely we say f is a map from the set a into the set b. Sometimes we also call it a function from a into b, but in a general context we always use the term map. And the subset gf which we started with, gets a new name, we call it the graph of f. Now, since the most important ingredients for a map f are the two sets a and b, they also get some new names. So the inputs for the function f are elements x from a, so we call the whole set the domain of f. On the other hand, we have all the potential outputs on the right hand side, therefore we call the set b the codomain of f. Most importantly, what you should take from this is, that we defined a map f with a lot of complicated notions, but we got out an object that connects the left hand side to the right hand side. Therefore the arrow here makes sense because each element on the left gets sent, gets mapped to the right hand side. Okay, in order to get this idea, let's look at an example. So let's start with a set A as the domain of the map and a set B as the codomain of the map. For this, let's just take visualizations for the two sets. Here we have the same set as before, a triangle, a square and a circle as elements. And the set B is just a collection of some numbers. Now the visualization for the map F would be something that goes from left to right. In fact, we could completely define the map by just drawing the lines from left to right. So here the triangle is mapped to the number 1. When we don't have the picture, we need to write this as f of triangle is equal to 1. Now in the same way, we could map the circle to the number 6. With this, we are almost finished, we just have to say where the square is sent to. And it is allowed to send it also to 6. Hence, please keep that in mind, the restrictions we have for a map only hold on the left hand side. For an element in A, there's only one arrow allowed that starts there. In fact, we already know we need exactly one arrow that starts there. However, then on the right hand side, everything can happen. We can leave elements out of the game and we can hit some elements more than one time. Okay, so this is the basic definition of a map, which we will use in all later videos. But first, in the next video, we will see more examples of maps and also talk about possible properties a map can have. 
Therefore, I hope I see you there and have a nice day. Bye.